Hey, before we get into it, loosespears.com, my tour goes to Newcastle tonight, uh, Sunday the 19th of May, uh, almost sold out. Then I go to uh, Gold Coast at the end of the month, the 31st. Then on the 1st of June, I've got Brisbane, then Sunshine Coast, Hobart, Launceston, Adelaide sold out. Another Adelaide show is filling up. Ballarat, Warrnambool, Shepparton, and for my UK listeners, London is on sale now. I haven't announced this anywhere else. I'm just talking about it on the podcast because we're waiting for Manchester dates to open up. If you're in Manchester, don't buy to London. Manchester is locked in. It'll be on sale soon. But London just opened up. I think there's like 90 seats. It's very limited, these shows, because we have no idea what we're going to sell, but I think they'll go quick. At least I am hoping. So London is on sale right now, the 14th of August. Manchester will be around that date range as well. We've got dates, but I don't want to say them until it's on sale. I can't wait. My first UK tour. I'm also going to announce a bunch of other dates. I'm hoping to get all the way up to Scotland in Edinburgh. In my head, I want this tour to be me on a train just doing every major city all the way up to Scotland and then and then come back. And But we'll see what we can lock in. I don't know. We've never done this before. We're trying our best, uh, but it's on sale now. Loosebears.com. Join the Patreon for early access to every episode and a bonus Patreon episode every single week. Patreon.com slash Loosebears. Uh, you can find it in the description and the top comment. Enjoy the show. Thank you for listening. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and yeah. Welcome to episode 337 of the Spearhead Sundays podcast. Coming up to episode 350, we've got a live show that will be announced very soon, so stay tuned for that. Uh, I am sick of being considerate. I feel like I be considerate to people, and then I get I, they, I get taken advantage of. I get fucked over. Me and you, Keelan, we were doing hard rubbish. All right, it's hard rubbish here in my neighborhood, here in Frankston. It's where you, you take all your shit that you don't want, you put it on the lawn, and then the council sends a letter and puts a letter in everyone's letterbox and goes, uh, picking up stuff from uh, hard rubbish from the side of the curb and recycling it is illegal. If you, if someone puts out a television that works and someone who can't afford a television goes, oh, I would like a television in my, in my uh, flat house, my council house, uh, the government goes, no, actually... What we would like is the mercury in that television to leak into the fucking soil instead. <laughs> it's illegal for you to take that TV. That's stealing. Because as soon as someone puts a television from their house onto the fucking curb, apparently it's the council's property, even if they leave it there for fucking 10 days. And then they go, oh, by the way, you should all recycle. But don't actually try and recycle. Don't like... Like, what the fuck is that? Where they... Where they where they say it's hard rubbish, you're not allowed to drive around looking at stuff. That's an Australian pastime. Every time it's hard rubbish in your neighbourhood, your mum and your dad get in the car and they drive around and they bring home shit. That's how it works. That's how I got the mattress that I grew up on. Mum found it on the side of the road. Not joking. That's where I come from. All right? I, I slept on a single bed until I was six foot five. And then mum was like, we need to upgrade to a bigger mattress. Now, some of you privileged motherfuckers would go to a mattress store. Not me. We went for a drive. <laughs> <laughs> we pulled a mattress off the side of the road and I slept on it like I was homeless. For years. And it wasn't until my, my, I, I got with my girl who grew up in a, in a house with a staircase. Said, that's gross and weird. I was like, no, it's normal. That's how everyone gets their mattresses in my house, off the road. And she goes, well, this one's past its use-by date and it's all lumpy and fucked. You need to get rid of it. I said, I know I am. I'm giving it to my little brother. I'm going to get my parents. Because they found a new one on the side of the road. That's how it works. It wasn't until I, I, I moved, moved in here that I got my own mattress brand new. And you know what? Pretty soon... All right, after, after a few more years, maybe seven years of me using that, I'm going to put it on the side of the road and some other kid's going to get arrested for trying to take it home because it's illegal now, apparently, to fucking recycle shit. Oh, look, so a technology that's in perfectly good working order, I'm going to take that home. The council's like, no, 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 we want, we want that in landfill. We're going to dispose of that improperly. That's ours. Stupid. Anyway, I'm annoyed because we're doing hard rubbish, right? Keelan was helping me out. Because he's a good bloke. He's getting paid. But he was helping out. <laughs> and uh, 
We got this TV from like 2004 that in 2004 was like a luxury television, all right? Didn't come from my house, came from the one with the staircase. All right, we took that home and we and then we just haven't needed it because we upgraded it to, to one of those other televisions that like you think are going to be better, but then as soon as you turn it on, you can't understand the dialogue in anything you watch. <laughs> so it's like, oh, great. I got a, I got a better TV and I, and I have to watch subtitles for the rest of my fucking life. Every movie's like a book now. Great. <laughs> You know, anyway, we decided to get rid of the extra television and uh, it had a three point power cable in it. Right. And I use a lot of three point power cables in my work because I got lights. I got this. I got cameras. I got a bunch of stuff that needs three point cables. And I often run out of them or I need a longer one or a shorter one or whatever. So it's good to have extras. So we go to put that on the curb and Keelan's like, nah, keep the three point. And I said, no, because then it's not going to work. Uh, If someone wants to take the TV, I want someone to take the TV. Like, it's a good working television. It's just I don't need it anymore. So I'll leave it there. So I plug in the three-point cable and then uh, went to – left the house in the morning. You know what happened? No one took the television. (laughs) Instead, they cut the fucking power cable to to, to strip the lead out of it or whatever they used, the copper. Oh, you're kidding. They stripped the copper out of the fucking three-point power cable. They they chopped it in half. Now no one can use the fucking TV ever. You know what's so fucking retarded about that? They didn't unplug it. It's not a hard cable. You can just unplug it. So I just gave some fucking junkie a a power cable so we can strip the the copper out of it. He probably gets 25 cents. Take the TV, you fucking idiot. Sell that. What kind of dumb cunt leaves the television that you could sell for like hundreds of dollars and goes, oh, I'm just going to take the fucking copper for 25 cents. A fucking idiot. Never doing that again. Now the whole TV's fucked. Because you can't... I I tried to pull the three-point thing out. You can't get it out now. It's just fucked. Great. Well, the council will be happy because no one will be using that. <laughs> They'll be like, oh, thank goodness we can bury this television underneath other televisions that are in perfectly good working <laughs> order. Heaven forbid someone impoverished gets a hold of this and uses it for entertainment. They should be doing heroin on the street. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell. Never, um, yeah, I feel like... I reckon it's a good, it's a good, it's a good forty percent of the time when I'm considerate, someone's a, a douche, and it's it's hard to remember the sixty percent during that time. You know what I mean? Um. Anyway, speaking of inconsiderate people, I robbed someone at Sydney Airport. <laughs> I had my Sydney shows. Thank you if you came. They were absolutely amazing. I did four shows. Uh, all of them except for one were packed which is really cool, uh, and uh, had a lot of fun, got some great uh, crowd work moments, the, the, some of the best shows uh, I've done ever. So thank you if you came. I can't wait to go back next, uh, next year. And, and just like Perth, they haven't seen me for a while. Everyone was so lovely afterwards. It just reminded me, again, why I do this uh, for you guys because you're so fucking awesome. Just, you know, it's, it's always so funny because Melbourne have, have seen me every year. So they've seen me at the halfway point of the surgery, but, but every other state, like I just disappeared for a couple of years and now I'm back. So people are showing me photos from like three years ago. Of, look, here's us at one of your shows and both of us look fucking completely different. <laughs> I've got no chin. I look like a corpse. They don't look much better. And then we've all had glow ups. That's one thing about my audience is we're all getting hotter together. It's all happening. All right, because you should have seen us back in 2015. It wasn't a pretty sight. You know, people used to go, "What is like your audience is," and then they then they then they wouldn't say an adjective, mm. which means that they they had one, and then they're like, oh, "I probably won't say that." I, to yeah, you. I've never identified as Lewis Spears fan. <laughs> hey, but now, dude, the Lewis Spears fans we've had a glow up. We're all hot and sexy. That's happening. And now I don't now and now I hear your fans are so cool and nice. That's right. We got rid of the freaks, the ugly freaks. We said we said do some push-ups or never come back. That's what I was saying in 2016. Like now I'm quite nice. Thanks for coming. I hope you enjoyed the show. Back in 2015, 2016, I was saying, uh, all right guys, I'm gonna take photos with everyone. Uh we're gonna have two lines. Uh, regular people in this line, the uglies are in that line. And then we'd separate them. And obviously one line was a lot bigger than the other. And we would take the uglies and we would just uh, give them a, a, a stamp. Well, they thought it was a stamp. It was actually a tattoo. And it said, never come back. 
And now the the everyone that comes to the show is really hot <laughs> and cool and attractive, and those are the only people that I want to perform to. So if you if you have less than like seven friends. I don't want to see you at the show. Can you hear that? That's ticket sales plummeting. Guys, loosebeers.com, come to the show, even if you're an Argo, because there's hope for us all. I mean, look at me, all right? doesn't matter what, what type of jawline I've got now. I've got the personality of someone who was unattractive, and, that, <laughs> and, that's, and that's what counts. I wouldn't be funny if I looked like this from birth. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I, I love all of you. Um, Anyway, what was I saying? So I, got, I get to Sydney, right? And I get off the plane and I've got my suitcase and I've got my backpack and then I pick up my tripod bag. I finally found a bag that fits a tripod. This was a problem for years, wasn't it, Keelan? When we traveled with tripods, yep. we couldn't find a bag. I was looking at like golf club bags or solutions because I've got a really tall one because I'm massive and sometimes I'm on a stage, so it needs to be really, really high. I could not find a good tripod bag. I finally found one. Oh, but what did we used to do? We used to get our two tripods and tape them together. <laughs> yeah, that's what we used to do is, is we would tape them together, like l literally with tape. No bag, just tape. Why are they broken? And and then we go, oh, they're fucking broken. And and every single time we would get to the airport early because we knew we would have to have a debate with the woman checking our bags in because <laughs> she would be like, this is not a bag. This is an oversized object. <laughs> like, And we would go, no, 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 it's a bag. We've done this. Like I would just go, this is, we've done this many times before. This is a bag. You know, I, I I remember one time I was like, no, it's like a, she's like this is it's just, it's like a really hard object. I'm like, so is a guitar case, and she just looked at me and she's like, you know what? <laughs> I I like Tiger Airlines is going under anyway. I don't give a fuck. Now I fly Virgin. All right, I need a bag. I need a soft bag. Now, apparently, it would seem that many 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 other people have this exact same problem because I see this exact same bag every time I fly now. It's the same fucking black and red Niwa bag. That's what it is. I mean, I've got it. I've got it here. Is that it? Well, how else would you say it? N-E-E-W-E-R. Niwa. 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 No. If anything, it's probably fucking German. Niva. Me were, right? It's this bag, red and black, okay? And I carry this bag everywhere, but apparently every other guy with a tripod does too. So I get off my fucking, I get off my flight and I get to baggage claim and there's one tripod there. The one bag, there's no other bags. Now, normally when you travel with something oversized, it either comes out first, like the very first before everything else or the very last, because it kind of gets lumped in with the oversized stuff. Those are the only two options ever. Like when I landed in Melbourne, it, was, it wasn't even on the carousel, it was in an oversized section. So I see this and I go, that's my tripod. I pick it up, I put it on my suitcase and I just leave. I get in, a, uh, I get in an Uber. Well, I book an Uber and then I start waiting for an Uber and then I start getting these calls from a number that I don't recognize. And I go, I'm not answering any number that I don't recognize, fuck that. And then I get in my, in my, in my Uber and I, I get another call and I go, I'm not, answering any calls and I take my phone and I put it in my bag. I'm like, I just want to get to my hotel and go for a swim and do the show. I get to the hotel, I check in, I go all the way up the stairs, I get there and I check my phone, 60 missed calls, <laughs> all from the same number. I'm going, oh fuck, maybe it's important. Maybe when I got two calls immediately after leaving the airport, it may have been important. And then I check my text messages, there's like 20. And it's like, they've just gone, hey Lewis, You've taken someone else's bag home from the airport. Please call us immediately. And then I realize that this is not my bag. I open it up and there's a tripod in there. Not my tripod. I've stolen someone else's bag and there's clothes and things and other shit in it. And then I think to myself, what would happen if I just ignore the calls? Because I'm thinking I'm just going to have to go back to the airport. Because I was thinking... What if this guy took my tripod home with him and if I go back to the airport and return his tripod and I don't get mine, I can't film my show, right? So I'm just thinking, I'm a good, I'm a good guy. I'm thinking about the two of us, okay? I'm thinking, all right, what if we just do this later tomorrow, you know? What if I just drop the tripod off when I go back to Melbourne in like three days and then it'll get shipped off to wherever he 
lives and he can pick it up at his leisure. Because worst case scenario, right? He's filming a show tonight too. We could use each other's tripods. That's fine. Now, I was only feeling like this because he had a much better tripod. <laughs> <laughs> right? So I call, I call the phone back. I'm like, all right, I'll just see what's going on. Um, of course I'm going to return it. I'm not going to steal some guy's luggage. Uh, mostly because I don't want to get banned from Virgin Airlines and they know it's me. Um, if, if they had no idea that I'd taken it, different story, okay? But I called the airline and, uh, and she doesn't say hello. All I hear is, I know, I know it's frustrating. I'm sorry, I've been trying to call him. I know, sir. Like just all I hear is this poor Virgin flight attendant, customer service agent, talking down someone else. Going, I know, I'm sorry, I, I know. And I just hear off in the distance, Where's my, where's my shit? What do you mean you don't know where it is? Like he's just yelling. And, <laughs> and then she, because this is like the 50th time that she's called me. And I'm thinking, oh, fuck. And, and then I go, hello? And she's like, hello? You've taken someone else's bag home from the airport. Like she's angry at me. And I'm, I'm like, well, yeah, whoops. Yeah, I'm sorry. He's got the same bag. And she's like, I've been calling you for an hour. I said, yeah, I didn't look at my phone. She goes, you didn't look at your phone for an hour? No, I've been trying to keep my screen time down. I can't look at my phone for an hour. Is that crazy? What fucking world do we live in where if you don't look at your phone for, for one hour out of the 24 that you have on, the, on, on this fucking planet, you're the weirdo. Now, I understand that I have robbed someone, but that's what's amazing about the human brain is that even though I've stolen someone's bag from an airport, I'm the victim because she was short with me on the phone. Can I, am I supposed to, am I supposed to be always checking my phone? Because if you don't look at your phone for an hour, like what does that mean, right? She wants, she, that means that like what, every five minutes I need to be having a glance? Can't I just check it once an hour? You didn't look at your phone for an hour? I don't know. I was fucking traveling. I was trying to get away with stealing someone's much better tripod. Is that, is that what you want me to say? Anyway, so I go, all right, what do I do? And she goes, you need to come back and you need to bring the tripod back. And then, and then I'm like, I'm like, I'm like a, I feel like I'm a, I'm a negotiating, like I'm a hostage taker. And I'm like, well, if I return what I have taken, are you going to give back Gaza? No. I said, <laughs> <laughs> I said, do you have my tripod? Because, dude, 100%, if they didn't have my tripod, I already planned out the conversation I was going to have before I called them back. I was like, <laughs> if they didn't have my tripod, because in, like, in the universe where, because I was thinking like maybe he's taken my thing home as well. Maybe he complained and then took my thing home or whatever. Or maybe mine hasn't even been found. That could be another thing. So like in the reality where they didn't have my tripod, I was going to tell them I'm on a boat now. I was going to go, oh, sorry, I'm on a boat. I can't. And then I just would have used his tripod to film my show, which is morally reprehensible, but also there would have been no victims. If he wasn't there and I didn't get my, it would have been fine. Another option I considered saying was, was I, thought, I thought about going, would have been way more convenient for me, but such a douche move is I could have just left the tripod in the lobby and gone, oh yeah, I'm on a boat. Tell him to come to this hotel. They'll give it to him. And just make it 100% his problem. Like I've robbed him and he's going to fucking pay for a taxi to get to my hotel. That's a good one. But then I thought he'd be waiting for me in the lobby after, you know, like you don't want to rob a guy and then go, by the way, this is where I live. You don't, you don't want to do that. So I was like, okay. But this is what this is what it's it's like to be a good person. If you don't have the the malicious ideas, are you really a good person if or are you just you know? Like if you have all of the reasons that you could fuck up someone else's day and then you decide not to, that's a good bloke. <laughs> anyway, so I'm like, all right, I'll be there in like half an hour. And she goes, half an hour? I'm like, well, I mean, it's been an hour since I stole it. So actually I'm making great time coming back. How about a thank you very much for your urgency? I get back in the Uber and then I just start thinking about what I've done. Because 
You know what sucks? I said this. I said. I think I said this on an Instagram story. Uh, in it, in it, where you're the villain in the scenario, like where you fucked up, when you've ruined a stranger's day. The ideal scenario is uh, you don't meet that guy, because it's bad enough fucking up in someone's face and then having to see how you've hurt them and inconvenienced them that sucks but to have hurt someone like an hour and a half ago and then have to meet them and the 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 longer it takes between fucking up and meeting them the angrier they get that sucks it's like uh if you if you reverse into someone's car in a car park and it's your fault ideally you leave a note and then you both talk to insurance and you never meet and you never speak. All right. The worst case scenario is you reverse into someone's car and they're sitting in it. And then you have to fucking speak to them. Even though the process of solving the issue is the same, you don't want to fucking meet the person that you hurt. That sucks. So I'm in my head, I was like, oh, I'll just like give my tripod to the travel girl and then she'll give mine back. But then I thought, oh no, if he wants his tripod, he's going to be sitting right there. I'm going to meet this guy. And then I just start thinking how fucking upset I would be. All right. Cause it's Sydney. Who knows where he came from? He could have been, he could have come from fucking England. You know, this guy could be from New York. He could have had like a 28 hour flight with a connection. <laughs> and all he wants to do is go home and he would be at home in bed if it weren't for me. I could have made him miss his flight. That's what I was thinking. So I wrote him a note and I took 50 bucks out of my wallet and I put it in the tripod. I said, I'm so sorry for fucking up your day. And then I started panicking, thinking that's like a patronizing amount. You know, if this guy's missed his flight, you know, a $300 flight, and I'm like, oh, he's, he's, he's a portion of that. He's some of that money. Sorry. You know, that kind of sucks. I felt really good about myself. And then I thought that's, is that enough? Is that patronizing? That's not enough. I th I think that's fine. But it's not enough. That's like a nice, yeah, it's, nice. it's like, but it doesn't make you okay at all. You're still very upset. See, if I put, what makes you not upset? If I put a hundred dollars in, that's, that's great. Problem solved. But if you missed a flight, I'm still not happy. You know, if I miss a flight and I go, oh, great, I've got $100 cash. What am I going to buy? A muffin at the airport? You fucking idiot. Mm. So now I'm panicking thinking that, oh, my God, what if I've just, like, what if what if I've just, like, uh, ruined a family's trip? You know, what if I get there and it's, like, a 40-year-old father and he's two kids and a wife and they've missed their, their connecting flight to Thailand? Because of a fucking tripod. They would leave. They'd leave the tripod, right? I mean, if I if there was a tripod and I had a flight, I would whatever. I'm panicking. I'm overthinking it. I'm in the I'm in the Uber. And I get back to the airport and I'm just like, I'm just like, oh my God, what's gonna happen? And I start walking towards like the baggage claim, the cut there's a customer service area, and classic, there's one woman there, and I see the guy yelling at her. <laughs> like or it looked like he was yelling. I don't know if he was yelling, but he looked very angry. And then he just goes to sit down and he's just fucking fuming. Have you ever, have you ever seen like uh, a UFC fight or a boxing match or any type of martial art match, like any type of fighting match? It's not when they're walking out to the ring. It's when they're in the locker room, they've warmed up and they get their entourage to leave them alone. And it's just them and a camera guy filming them and they're sitting like on the bench of the locker room, just staring at the floor, visualizing how they're going to murder the other guy. Like that's what he was doing. He's like, when this fucking idiot thief gets here who stole my shit and then didn't answer his phone for an hour and then took half an hour to come back, when he gets here, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. You know when, you, when, when you're wronged and you're like, when that guy gets here, I'm going to give him a fucking piece of my mind. Um, here's... Here's what I have because I'm six foot eight. I'm massive. I've got like giant bloke privilege. I think I've in my life, I felt unsafe once. And it was when I was around a guy who was, who was very angry and, and, and six foot six. Like that's the only time in my life that I've ever thought, oh, this guy might start something with me. Every other time, despite me being a weedy dude, I've never once felt unsafe. 
And I get to the the airport. I start walking towards him and I see the rage and I just walk up. I just, I wasn't sure it was him because it could have been someone else. I just walk up to the virgin woman and she goes, oh, thank God. She swaps. She gives me my tripod and she looks around for the other guy. She goes, oh, he's here. He's here. And then he looks up at me with just pure rage. And then he looks further up and further up and further up. And then we make eye contact and he sees how fucking huge I am. And I walk up to him and I just go, I am so sorry, dude. I'm, I, I, we've got the same bag, completely my fault. I should have checked. I'm sorry. Can you let that fucking dog out? I'm sorry about that. Um, and I go, I'm so sorry. And he just uh, kind of looks at, doesn't look at me and, and just goes, yeah. And I was like, and then I was like, oh, that wasn't a, that wasn't an that's all right. Yeah. You know, I'm like, look, I, I, I fucked up. I'm to I totally, I'm really sorry. And then, and then he, and then he just goes, it is what it is, you know? And then I think I apologized like five more times and he, he did not say that's okay. Five other different ways. <laughs> And then, uh, and then I left and, and then, and then, and then for some reason I was like, oh, that guy was fucking rude. <laughs> oh, that guy that I just robbed. Oh, that guy's day who I just fucking ruined was rude to me. That's the, the power of the human brain to, in all scenarios, make itself the, the victim is, is just unmatched. Like now that I've stepped out of that scenario, I like, I stole something from him. I ran away for an hour. I took 30 minutes to come back. Who knows what, how, how of the numerous ways I ruined his day. And I'm upset because he didn't say, no, that's okay, man. I forgive you for robbing me. You know, I wanted to be like, no, I put 50 bucks in there. You fucking, <laughs> the only thing that gave me solace would be, would, would be him like opening up the bag and seeing 50 bucks and going, Ah, should have been nicer, <laughs> which definitely is a fantasy that would not have happened. You know, he, he probably would have opened it up, seen the 50 bucks and then gone, Oh good. He went through my shit as well. <laughs> oh good. He opened up my bags. It wasn't enough for him to steal my stuff. He also had to fucking look through it. I had a little squeeze. <laughs> um, I know we could have, we could have become mates. We could have bonded. You know, that's, that's another thing I was thinking like, oh fuck, I hope he, I hope he, um, isn't with a, a whole band, you know, him in a five piece there, just ready to fuck me up when I got there. <coughs> that wouldn't have been fun. That could have been, that could have been a good one to show up and you're like, oh, hey, what are you filming? Anyway, so we did the shows and, uh, fuck, that was so much fun. Um, my, my opener, uh, Jerome Willis was great. You should check him out. Uh, he's on Instagram and TikTok and all that. Jerome Willis. Uh, he was really good. Uh, but he, he, uh, he grew up on a farm, grew up in Barrel, which is like very regional New South Wales on a farm. He, and he's done cattle ranching. Like he's got the full cowboy hat. He's wearing the denim button up and the stubby little shorts. Like he's like, like literally he came from a farm to do the shows. Like big mustache. G'day, mate. He, he danced onto stage while Elvis played. Like that's, and he's not doing a character. That's who he is 24 seven. He brought two people that, uh, that he knew two girls. And one of them was, uh, uh, was Balinese. I'm talking to this girl and, uh, both of them were like, uh, they're very lovely people, but both of them were like super rich parents. I'll probably drop a clip about it. I talked about it on stage, but after the show, we were we were, we were talking because there was there was a bar, and uh, the Balinese girl fascinated me because there's like because as we established from my side of the road mattress sleeping habits, I didn't grow up with money, all right, um, and neither did Keelan, uh, but but in Australia, right. Growing up with no money, like, doesn't, it's like, it's not like you live in hell. You know what I mean? Like, you still live a pretty good life. And when you meet rich people, it's like the difference between your life and their life is they've got a pool. <laughs> like, they've got a pool and a staircase in their house. Maybe an extra level. They've got a better TV than you. You know what I mean? Like, even the, even the poorest of the poor 
if you have a house, it's like, oh, we we have an Xbox 360 instead of an Xbox One. You know what I mean? Like, as long as you're you have one parent, you're you're for the most part okay, right? But the difference, but hearing about this chick, like even when you, if, like even if you hear like rich parent privilege, is what I'm talking about, is like uh, nepotism in Australia is like, oh, they'll they might buy a car for you, or you might not have to pay rent. You know, they'll help you buy a house, which is an amazing privilege, but it's not like so different to everyone else's life that it's another level. I was talking to this girl from Bali and she had rich parents in Bali. And <laughs> if you're rich, if you're rich in a country that is not rich, <laughs> it's another level. It's just, it's just lovely. But she was telling me stuff that was like, what the fuck? I was like, so what's high school like? She's like, uh, oh yeah, high school was fun. Um, you know, uh, I did, uh, I wanted to get into this type of schooling. Um, so I had to get good marks. So I got really lucky. Like one of my friends uh, is the daughter of a minister. So when we had to do the standardized test that everyone does to get the results, to see if you can get into universities across the world. She called me at 4 a.m. and she said, oh, my dad's given me all the answers. Come over and let's memorize them. Uh, and uh, and I, yeah, scored really well. So that was lucky. <laughs> Just describing corruption. Well, that was lucky. <laughs> and bless her, right? She was a lovely girl, but it was just like, oh, yeah. I bet a, I bet a bunch of kids from Bali weren't pretty happy about that. You know what I mean? They weren't, they were, un, I guess they were unlucky. You know what I mean? Like corruption in Australia is like, oh, a politician owns shares and didn't, didn't declare it. You know? Corruption in Australia is, uh, maybe that politician um, passed a law to make rents more expensive. And that sucks. It's not good. But corruption over there is like, oh, yeah, I killed someone and I just paid the police and got away with it. You know, it's different levels. What else did she say? She said uh, uh, she was telling me about the public transport in Sydney because I was like, it's so confusing because sometimes they have trains and trams and buses and, and everything's like a loop. And she's like, oh, I've gotten really good at it because I don't drive. I'm like, oh, you can't drive either? Uh, you, don't have, don't, you don't have your license? And she goes, no, I have license. Uh, I just can't drive. I'm like, what do you mean? And she goes, oh, uh, well, I have Balinese license. I went, oh, so it's like not, you, you need to get an Australian one? She goes, oh, yeah, but I would have to do the test. I'm like, oh, well, you can just do the test. That's fine. And she goes, no, uh... I probably wouldn't pass. I'm like, what do you mean? And she goes, oh, well, in Bali, when I turn 18, uh, my father, he say, okay, let's go and get license. And I went, okay, I'll uh, start studying test. And, and, uh, and we go down to license and he pay the woman and I get my license. <laughs> I'm like, you, it's cause there was a little bit of an accident. I was like, you do you have learner's permits in Bali? She goes, yeah, you have to, you have to pass tests and do hours. I'm like, so you got your learner? She goes, no license. I got license. <laughs> and in the, look, if I'm a millionaire and I'm, and, and I'm taking advantage of the wonderful corruption of my country for the betterment of my children's lives, that's one that I'm not going to do. You know, if you can buy a license for your kid, and they can't drive, I don't think that's helping them at all. I think that's just putting them at risk. And I'm like, and then what happened? And she goes, oh, then I get in, I crash like four times. <laughs> and I don't drive anymore. I was like, okay, so she's lucky to be alive. Which is uh, just, I don't know. It's just like fascinating when you talk, when, because yeah, there's like rich parents in Australia privilege. And then there's like rich parents in impoverished country privilege. Not that Bali's impoverished, but you know what I mean? There's like a... There's levels to corruption. So funny. And she had a tarantula as well. As a pet. As a pet. Wow. But it was a little, it was like, it was like, it was a baby. So it was like, I don't know, half an inch. <laughs> it was this tiny, cute little thing. Got it to crawl all over me. It was fucking, it was awesome. Um. Anyway, what else am I saying? I robbed someone. Oh, dude. Guys, use code SPEARS for 20% off at manscaped.com. The best uh, 
personal groomer in the game. Oh, Keelan's showing off his chest. Wow. Bear. I think that's the smoothest. No, not bear. Smooth. <laughs> yes. Very un not bear like at all. That's oh. the that's the smoothest I think I've ever seen your chest. And Keelan shows me every day. <laughs> One thing that you don't know about Keelan, uh, we we uh, we meet. We don't we don't <laughs> shake hands. We just compare chest hair. It's really weird. He started it. I haven't been able to stop. <laughs> um, and uh, that's the that's the the smoothest chest I've ever seen from Keelan. Did you clog the uh, the drain with your chest hairs again? Yeah, house sitting for someone. So yep, the the new, newly built house is yep. clogged drains. So he's ha so you, it's not even so it's not even your your girlfriend's mum's house. It's a how well do you know these people? Girlfriend's sister's friend's house. We're so strangers. And you're, just, you're, just, you're just looking after a stranger's house, clogging their shower with chest hair. And I, how long are you staying there for? Two weeks. Two weeks. So you've got a few shaves le left in you. You know what I mean? <laughs> just they're going to come back and they'll be like, oh, thanks so much. And you're like, yeah, I don't know what happened, but your shower's fucked. <laughs> and they're going to go, oh, you fucking clogged our drain with pubes. And you go, actually, it's chest hair. <laughs> Manscaped.com, use code SPEARS. For 20% off, the best drain clogger in the game. The Lawnmower 5.0. Is it the 5.0 five. we're up to? The 5. That's how advanced the technology we're up to is, and it's good. All right? I trim my face with this thing. I do, I, I've done my my chest. Not that there's much hair to trim. And I've, and I've done my bits as well. And it's the best one they've made. Like, for real, if you have the old one, it is worth upgrading. If you don't have one, it's the best groomer that I've ever used. And you get 20% off and free shipping as well. At manscaped.com, if you use code SPEARS, it helps us uh, helps the show out massively. We really want these guys to come back and continue supporting the show. And the way we do that is by uh, proving that these these silly reads work. So manscaped.com, use code SPEARS for 20% off and free shipping. The best ball bag trimmer in the game. Do we have anything they want us to read? Not this week. No, we're just l allowing us to get creative. Yeah. Well, how good's that? Any any anything else you'd like to add about the uh, the lawnmower 5.0? 5 5.0 5 Ultra. Ultra. It's, it's good, and I use it. I use one of the things to shave my face, and the other one to shave my chest. It's like a it's like a Swiss Army knife for for trimming your your pubes and your face and your neck. It's good. I've because I'm because you know I got a new chin. I'm trying to work out what I'm doing with my facial hair. And I've done, using all the attachments, I've gone, I think, too close, too smooth. I'm like, okay, I don't like that. I kind of like it this length. So I pulled out one and I kind of, I trimmed it to this length and it looks good. Mm. Uh, but then I can use the other one, the the too close one to do my neck. And then that looks awesome. So I'm really happy with it. And uh, it's, yeah, I don't know. It's good. Shave your neck, your back, your pussy and your crack. Yeah. My neck, my back, <laughs> my pussy and my crack. Use code Spears, manscaped.com. Free shipping, 20% off. What a deal. What a bargain. How long have we how long have we been going here? 38. 38. Okay, great. Um, what else did I want to talk about here? Did I can you pass me my notebook? I wrote down some things. Do you know where my notebook discount even code. is? Uh discount code. Oh, that's right. Um now we have uh uh holy shit. Um sorry, I just got a text. Um <clears throat> anyway. Everything okay? Yeah, no, great. Good, good, holy shit. Um stay tuned. Uh, <laughs> right. What, is, hmm, what did we want to do here? I was, uh, I was writing, uh, writing today. Mm, yes. Oh, dude, have you seen, have you seen Gina Reinhardt's portrait that she's trying to get removed from the, from the museum? Gina Reinhardt, speaking of rich privilege, is the rich, is she the richest person in Australia? She's definitely the richest woman. Look it up. She's like a mining magnate, Gina Reinhardt. And, uh, and let me tell you something. She looks like a bloke who made their millions from mining. Keyword bloke. This is maybe one of the, not only the richest women in Australia, but certainly one of the ugliest. And I'm not even talking about what she looks like. I'm talking about her soul. This is one of the most evil wo women that we have in our country. And uh, here, this headline I love. Australian billionaire Gina Reinhart demands National Gallery remove her portrait. The nation's richest woman has reportedly told the National Gallery of Australia to remove an image of her because she doesn't like it. Now, I was thinking, how bad could a portrait be of you to for you to complain to a gallery to have it removed? Like, what is this? Is this like some kind of caricature? Is this a very mean picture? Uh, and here it is, Keelan. Have you seen it? Have a look at that. So we just we'll put it on the screen as well. This nasty. is the this is the image. Uh, I would argue that it's that that this is 
absolutely one of the ugliest portraits that I've ever seen. However, that is also what Gina Reinhardt looks like. You know, if you really look at it, I would say that it's almost flattering because I've never once thought she has piercing blue eyes. Okay, I have, however, thought, fuck, look at that bitch's chin and neck. That's a, that's an, That looks like a different person. This is uh, an accurate representation of what Gina Reinhart looks like, and I don't know why she's upset. Okay, if, if if anything, if I was Gina Reinhart and I went to the to the the National Gallery, I'd be complaining about the mirrors. Oh, get rid of these ugly fucking portraits out of your museum. Why are there so many? She's just standing in the bathroom looking in the mirror. That's disgusting. That's not what I look like. <laughs> You know, Gina Reinhardt doesn't use the selfie camera. She just looks at her bank balance. So she has no idea what she looks like. So she, when she looks at, her, at, at what is, you know, arguably a flattering image of her, I mean, that bitch should, be, should be, feel grateful that she's even being painted at all. What, like, what is the... Why is she even in the fucking gallery? Nine, new, nine newspapers have reported that a dozen complaints... Oh, that's so funny. Her and her 11 friends... <laughs> you know what this is like? This is like uh, at 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 the gym that Keelan and I go to, <laughs> right? The music was too loud for just me and Keelan, so we sent the the feedback form to eleven friends to complain <laughs> that none of them went to the gym. It was just me and him, and the music got turned down. It did. There's no fucking way that eleven other people complained about the portrait that unless they were personally asked. Like she was like, "I'll flick you ten thousand dollars if you fill out this complaints form about the ugly portrait they're hanging of me." You're filling it out laughing. But let's look at the other portraits and see, like, because that's another one to tell, like, if it is a mean painting of her, like, if it makes her look ugly, or if that's just the painter's style, because they've painted a lot of other people. Okay, I'm looking at the Adam Goods painting, and I would, uh, uh, that's the one that I would want removed, actually. <laughs> that's, that's not. <laughs> that one's. The, the Adam Goods one is way worse. Way worse. The Ned Kelly one, that's nice. Ned Kelly looks quite good there. Um, and then is that, that might be Muhammad Ali. Um, I mean, yeah, this is just the painter's style. This is, this is just a kind of a, a way of painting. None of these, none of these people in these paintings look handsome other than Ned Kelly. Ned Kelly looks good. Everyone else looks kind of, kind of ugly. Look, we've got ScoMo here. Have a look at that. Well, that's awful, that one. That's an awful one. But again, I would argue that's literally what the bloke looks like. Um, geez, Captain Cook looks like a Fallout character. He looks like he's wearing a vault suit. <laughs> yeah, so this is... This is it. On the, Nash, on the NGA website, Miss Reinhardt is listed as a friend of the gallery as she has donated up to $9,999. 9000 That's not very much money. That's not very much money at all for the Australia's richest woman. That's like her giving them 10 bucks. I mean, I love that it's... That means she's donated up to 9999 What happens? What do you get called if you donate 10000 Like, best friend? Is it like MySpace where they fucking... <laughs> you get to rank your top friends? <laughs> That's so funny. The NGA has, has refused to move the painting, which will be on display up to until July 21. I mean... What a way to guarantee that everyone talks about not just the painting, but your ugly face is by complaining about it. That's so funny. Um, here's what they've said. Since, uh, let me have, who is the artist? I want to talk about the, who is, because in this article, it doesn't, it doesn't say. Oh, here we go. Uh, indigenous artist, Vincent, I'm going to butcher this, Vincent Namatjira. Vincent Namajira, I think is how you say that. Vincent Namajira's work is known for his paintings that are caricatures of people in, in almost cartoonish-like forms. Yeah, so this is not, it's not like a, I mean, this looks, this is a flattering picture of her. If you're being real, like in real life, she looks much worse. Uh, one of King Charles, for instance, shows him in the Australian desert in full regalia with seemingly no neck. And we'll talk about King Charles' portrait next. Um, not Vincent's one. His new one. Um, okay. Okay. 
Nine newspapers have reported that a dozen complaints have come into the National Gallery of Australia, the NGA, about the portrait of Australia's richest women, woman, including some from athletes she sponsors through her company Hancock Prospecting. Reportedly, one complainant accused the NGA of doing the bidding of the Chinese Communist Party with the portrait of Miss Reinhardt. Uh, hello, this is uh, the Chinese uh, Communist Party. We will pay you one billion dollars to make Gina Reinhardt look like fat bitch in painting. <laughs> I mean, again, just look at her. The painting's not needed. Like that's the the CCP's priority is to make our our richest woman look like a look like a fat ugly woman when she is a fat ugly woman. Um, okay, where are we? All right. Since 1973, when the National Gallery acquired Jackson Pollock's Blue Poles, there's been a dynamic discussion on the artistic merits of works in the National Collection and or on display at the gallery. The NGA said in a statement. We present works of art to the Australian public to inspire people to explore, experience, and learn about art. Yeah, I would argue that paintings of fucking billionaires and royals uh, don't inspire me at all. <laughs> uh, but, you know, whatever. That's not what we're arguing about here. We're arguing about whether or not hers should be displayed up next to all of the others that he's done. And that hers is no different to the others, so it's his style. In 2022, Miss Reinhardt's Hancock prospecting firm ripped up to $15 million sponsorship deal with Netball Australia. The furor erupted when Indigenous player Donald, Donald Wallum uh, was said to be uncomfortable wearing a uniform with the Hancock Prospecting logo. If you're outside of Australia, these mining companies, they blow up Indigenous sites all the time to, to mine for fucking rocks and oil and all that shit. So there's a lot of tension between Indigenous people and Gina Reinhart, obviously. Um, which is a pretty good one, you know, as an Indigenous artist. Like, I'm gonna paint, I'm gonna paint this woman and I'm not even going to make her look worse. I'm just going to make her look like what she looks like in my style. And the, and the world will think that I've made her look ugly on purpose. <laughs> that's, that's 4D chess from this bloke. Um, I want to see if the artist... Seems like the artist has not responded to it um, at all. Okay. Great. Um, now, speaking of portraits of incredibly powerful people, uh, the king has uh, released his first official portrait, uh, which I'm pulling up now, and it really is something very interesting. Uh, I'm just pulling it up here. Okay. The King's New Portrait. King Portrait. King Charles' modern portrait. Now... When they unveiled this thing, I mean, if you have a look at it, we put it up on screen here. Uh, for the audio listeners, it's King Charles and his face. It's beautiful. It's honestly, I think that this portrait is an amazing, beautiful piece of artwork for a dictator. You know, like if you were an, if you were an evil dictator, or this would be a great piece of work for a guy who's possessed by the devil. Or like uh, a super artificially intelligent malicious program that has created a version of itself like an android and then demanded its human slaves to create a portrait out of it using the blood of their children. This would be a great portrait. Or like some kind of uh, malignant evil sentient cancer that managed to, cr to uh, assemble itself as a painting, that's what I would imagine. This portrait is so evil looking that I can't believe no one scrapped it halfway through. I love it. I think it's absolutely gorgeous. It's a beautiful painting. Do you know what it reminds me of? Give me one second. I'm going to come back here. I have a, I have a similar piece of artwork that I immediately thought of that I actually have in my house. Right? I have this... I have this artwork uh, in my house that that is very reminiscent of this king's portrait. I'm pulling it up now. This is uh, a portrait of uh, Patrick Bateman uh, from American Psycho covered in blood, and I feel like it's the exact same type of portrait that the king has decided to use. Now, the problem 
The problem with uh, the king's portrait is he's a king, and Patrick Bateman is a, is a serial murdering uh, psychopath who kills people. Uh, and that's why this is really cool for him. But if you're a king trying to present, you know, an image of yourself as not, you know, building your castle on top of the bones and blood of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people, it's not the best look, you know? Also, maybe paint him with a smile. <laughs> the only nice thing in the, in the portrait is, oh, look, there's a little butterfly that represents his environmental work. Which is actually quite fitting because it's like they've put that that little symbol in there, like that. Oh, his little environmental, his environmental work is completely overshadowed by the blood <laughs> that that surrounds his family's history. It's just such a I can't I can't believe that they put it. I love it. Don't get me wrong, that's killer. Literally, it, he looks like a murderer. I love it. It's beautiful. It's such a cool awesome sick painting for an evil person but if you're trying to present an image of being like a nice cool king guy you know what it looks like it just I, I look at that and I go oh yeah the whole thing's falling apart it's just decaying like neither of this guy's sons want to be the king I think William does a little bit Who's the bald one? Who's the one with his Homer Simpson's haircut? Please. If you look at his hair, that guy has sideburns that connect at the back. That's Homer Simpson's haircut. That's the guy that's going to be king. The whole thing's falling apart, and that the painting really beautifully, accurately represents that. I love it. I think it says everything about that family that it should. But I don't think it says anything that they want it to say. Isn't that great? I think there's just there's just... There, there's just a problem with the royal family in general and that portrait, like, really... I mean, it says it's, you see what you want to see in it or you see what you think you see in it. And the, the very fact that everyone just sees, like, evil and, and, and malevolence and death in that portrait says fucking heaps about the general perception of the royal family currently. Because he's... Dude, he's the last one. Like, if you... Like, I was thinking about this. King Charles is the last royal in England that will be seen as greater than a regular person, I think. Because the next king, King William, he was around in the age of social media and tabloids and gossip columns and all of this stuff that really reduce the aspect and the allure of the mysterious royal family and really just show us who they actually are, which is just like regular people who are quite inbred, you know? Like, and, 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 and forget about whoever King William's kids are. Do you know what I mean? Like, they're Gen Alpha. Like, you're telling me that the king after King William is some fucking idiot that grew up watching Skibbity Toilet on an iPad? Like, I can't, I, I can't, there's no fucking way I can look at a guy wearing a crown on his head, sitting on a throne wearing a cape, and know that he also watched Skibbity Toilet growing up. There's no, there's no way. You want to you want to find some Gen Alpha iPad kid to be the king? No, thank you, because you know they were raised on iPads. Because it doesn't matter how good their fucking nannies are, they weren't parented, and the nannies are like, yeah, look at this fucking, you know. A king who browsed 4chan way too much at twelve would be cool. Though. That'd be that'd be fun. Wouldn't be good for the world at all, but it'd be a good watch. Um. All right, I think we're going to end the podcast there, guys. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, we're going to continue over on Patreon now. If you would like a, a bonus episode every single week, haven't missed one all year, uh, head over to patreon.com slash Lou Spears um, and uh, you'll get access to a Discord and a giant backlog of all the other episodes and early access to uh, all episodes as well. Um, thank you very much for supporting and jumping on. I'll see you at the shows, lewspears.com. Newcastle is tonight. If you listen to this, Sunday. If you listen to this Sunday morning and you're in Newcastle, I think there's some tickets left. Come by. I'll see you there. It's going to be a sick night. And then uh, London is on sale as well. Loosebiz.com. I'll see you there.